metal roofing is really popular right now. People like the look of it. There's a lot of different colors you can get. I'm not crazy about it, but you know that's my opinion. I'm, I'm more of an asphalt shingle guy myself, but the way you would order a metal roof is you would pick out a color. There's a million different colors you can get, and you would put in an order. This isn't something that you generally go and like pick up at the supplier. You would have to put in an order because they would cut these panels to length for you. So you would have ideally one continuous sheet from the ridge down to the eave. They're generally about two feet wide and they've got these little ridges and the sheets overlap and there's like a, I guess kind of a female and a male side on these sheets and they click together. There's usually a little strip on one sheet that gets screwed down to the deck and then the next piece overlaps that and clicks over it so that all of those screws are concealed. One big benefit of the metal roofs is it's really good for areas with snow load. Snow will not cling to it and so it'll want to or as easily so the snow will kind of want to slide off and then in theory it doesn't have a whole bunch of seams all over the place so if the snow melts and then refreezes or does something weird it can't like creep into the seams and get underneath the roofing material so it's pretty good um, in that regard but i would also argue that you want to leave the snow on your roof okay snow on your roof is an added layer of insulation okay so it's akin to like building an igloo okay the snow acts as a layer of insulation so these things installing them can be easy or hard mostly depending on how steep the roof is one of my complaints with the metal roofing is it's really hard to walk on this stuff. It gets really, really slippery. So any amount of moisture, any amount of dirt on this stuff, and you're, you're basically walking up a slide. So you get accustomed to walking up certain pitches on asphalt shingle roofs or wood shingle roofs or something like that. And you try and walk up that same pitch with a metal roof and you're going to slide off the roof and fall on the ground. So it, it can be a little more dangerous depending on the steepness of the roof. This is kind of my preferred shingle material. They're called dimensional shingles or architectural shingles. They're made of asphalt and felt paper like I talked before. Um, and again, kind of like with the torch down roofing, they have a layer of gravel embedded in that final layer of tar that gives the shingle some UV protection. You can get different colors with this stuff and basically what they do is they spray paint the rocks that get embedded in this material. Depending on what kind of shingle you get, you could get a 30 year shingle or a 50 year shingle and the difference is they're thicker, all right? The 40 year shingle, the 50 year shingle have additional layers of paper and tar. So if you're talking about squares of shingles, if you have a 30 year roof, you're going to get three bundles, excuse me, of shingles per square. So every three bundles of shingles for a 30 year roof is going to cover 100 square feet. For the 40 year roof and the 50 year roof, it's going to be four bundles of shingles per square. So that's basically due to the additional thickness of the shingle. I like the stuff. It's it's the most common. It's the easiest to use and figure out. It's pretty forgiving since it's a bunch of individual tiles. If you screw up one piece of metal, that whole piece of metal needs to be recycled. Whereas if you screw up one shingle, it's not that big of a deal to just tear it off and grab another shingle. And I would also say it's it's probably the most cost effective and it tends to just blend in okay i i'm a firm believer in your roof shouldn't be the 
architectural focal point of the house. So if you have like a, you know, chartreuse metal roof on your house, I, I don't really think that's what I, how I want to call attention to my house. But if I just have like black or brown architectural shingles, it just kind of blends in and doesn't kind of steal the show. All right, so here's a picture of some felt paper getting put down and the shingles, the torch down roofing, it's basically layers of felt paper and tar and rocks, okay? We're gonna roll this out starting at the bottom and we're gonna wanna staple this down and then overlap each previous course with the next course. At least an inch and a half, there's usually lines chalked on that felt paper that show you the appropriate overlap. If you're gonna come back and shingle this thing like that day or soon after, it's not gonna be too windy, you can staple it down and it'll be fine. One thing you wanna really try and do is staple through these seams, okay, where this piece overlaps this piece, you're gonna to wanna to staple that seam down really well and that's gonna save you time and materials and hold this down better. You wanna make sure to staple the bottom pretty well so it doesn't blow up, same thing on the sides. If you're gonna put this on and then leave for weeks or something like that, you're gonna to wanna to put some cap staples down or maybe nail some two by fours on the roof deck to hold this paper down because what's gonna happen is this felt paper is going to absorb moisture and release moisture. It's gonna heat up and shrink and it's gonna cool down and expand. And it's gonna do this three times, four times every day. And every time it does that, it loosens the staples a little bit. And eventually it's gonna break away from the staples and then the wind's gonna pick up and it's gonna blow all of that felt paper off the roof. So, either only felt, only cover what you're gonna be able to shingle in a reasonable amount of time, or come back with some cap staples, and those are gonna hold a lot better than the regular staples. Okay, so you can call this either 15 pound or 30 pound, I think technically it's number 15 and number 30, but I think originally, maybe this isn't the case anymore, but originally 15 pound or number 15 felt weighed 15 pounds per square. And a 15 pound, or excuse me, 15 pound roll of felt covers four squares. So 400 square feet of coverage in a 15 pound roll. 30 pound felt or number 30 felt covers two square of roofing. It's twice as thick as 15 pound. I tend to, I've actually moved to synthetic roofing under limit, which we're going to talk about in a minute here, but I was always a proponent of 15 pound felt. People would try and sell you 30 pound felt because it's like, a better roof because it's thicker, it's twice as thick. But one thing we need to keep in mind, especially older homes that may not be sealed up as well, if we are, and especially attics that aren't properly ventilated, if we have an attic space that isn't properly ventilated, warm, moist air is going to pass through the deck, the roofing deck rather than being expelled through our ventilation system. So, the way this is supposed to work, if you do have warm, moist air passing through the sheathing, is you want it to be able to relatively easily pass through the felt paper, where then it will condense on the underside of the shingle and turn back into liquid water, and then you have liquid water sitting on top of the felt paper. If you have 30 pound felt, or if you have a bunch of layers of roofing, or if you doubled up the felt, or you did something weird, 
it can be difficult for that moist air to pass through that felt paper. And so maybe instead of condensing on the backside of the shingles, it's going to condense on the underside of the felt paper. And then you have liquid water on top of the roof deck. And then you're going to have moisture, mold, fungus, termite problems. Okay. And then hopefully that answers the question of, well, do you really need felt paper or some sort of underlayment? Absolutely. Every single time. It doesn't, but just think about it in the context of that is not generally the protection against the weather. It's not supposed to be like keeping all of the liquid water out, okay? It's supposed to act as a semi permeable vapor retarder. And vapor is supposed to be allowed to pass through, condense on the shingle. And then when it turns into liquid water, keep the liquid water off the roofing deck. All right. Here's a picture of the synthetic underlayment. The thing I really like about the synthetic underlayment is it's tougher. Okay. I felt like the felt paper was kind of prone to tearing at times, especially if it's been sitting around for a while. The synthetic paper seems to be a lot tougher. It seems to be more like abrasion, scuff resistant and stuff like that. One thing that most manufacturers are recommending is that you don't use the staples. You only use the cap staples. And that's kind of nice. The cap staples are going to hold it a lot better. And then my understanding is that the hammer tacker when you staple into felt paper, it'll kind of heal up. Heal isn't the right word because the felt paper isn't like a living thing, but it will take an abrasion better with the stapler than the synthetic underlayment will. Cap staples are recommended for the synthetic underlayment. All right, here is a roofing underlayment video that you should all watch. And it's from Owens Corning, a manufacturer of roofing materials. And they go over the proper application for their material. And one of the things that consistently comes up with, you know, how do I install this product? The answer is always, refer to the manufacturer's instructions. There's nothing in the California building code about how to install synthetic roofing underlayment. Okay. So you need to refer to the manufacturer's instructions because what's going to happen if there's a problem and you're trying to get a warranty out of this material, the manufacturer is going to say, well, did you follow our instructions and there's only two possible answers to that okay i want to talk about drip edge and this is something that's really commonly misunderstood you for the most part have to use some sort of metal on the rakes and the eaves and that metal is going to protect the end of the plywood, the end grain of the plywood. It's usually really thin gauge metal that we can manipulate with tin snips, aviation snips, whatever you want to call them, but we can cut it and fold it really easily. And we can just nail through it with the roofing gun. And it's pretty easy to manipulate. And so this is the big important thing here. When we're working on the eave, the drip edge metal is going to nail directly to the deck. So this is going to happen before we put underlayment on. Okay. And so think about water in this regard. Let's just pretend that we do have liquid water on top of our roofing underlayment. If this metal is on first and then we put our underlayment over the metal, then any water that's on top of the underlayment will just roll into the gutter, okay? A common mistake that people make 
is they put the underlayment on first and then cap that with the drip edge. But if we have liquid water on the underlayment, then it's going to catch here and it can get underneath that metal and then it's getting into the end grain of the plywood. Okay. This, it looks tidy when you cap the underlayment with the drip edge, but that is backwards as far as water management goes. Okay. All right. To complicate things now, <clears throat> the drip edge is going to go over the underlayment on the rake. Okay, so if we were to talk about an order of installation here, we would go drip edge on the eave, then synthetic underlayment, then drip edge on the rake. Okay. And the idea behind that is when we're talking on about the rake, we're not so much worried about um, liquid water getting behind something and if, if it's on the underlayment already. Okay, because it's going to have a tendency to just roll downhill towards the eave. The concern with the drip edge on the rake side is when we have wind-driven rain blowing against the rake. If the drip edge went on first and then the underlayment went over that, it's very much in the realm of possibility that water could just get blown underneath that underlayment. Whereas if we put the underlayment on first and then the drip edge, then if water's blowing against the rake, it's just going to go over that drip edge and then it'll be on top of the underlayment. Okay, so that's the best practice for that. And here we have a little video about how to install drip edge on a roof. And so again, this is from... I, I would say there's not necessarily like a brand specific way to install drip edge. Okay. Gaff doesn't make their own drip edge. They make roof materials, but they don't necessarily make their own drip edge. So you could watch this video and apply it to any sort of roofing materials or, you know, drip edge materials. <clears throat> 